yeah! It is Behind the Bastards, a podcast that is always opened with a mixture of consummate skill uh, and, of course, inimitable charisma uh, by myself, Robert Evans. Also with me on the call today, Sophie Lichterman, my producer, and our lovely guest, Sophia Alexandra. Sophia, can Hi. you do? Can you do a good? Can you do a good? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That was good. That was good. Thank you so much. I I actually in my free time I uh, moonlight as the Kool Aid Man. Oh so. yeah! I I had heard that. I had heard mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will not yeah. be doing that because I would like to be excluded from this narrative. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sophie's just saying that because she drives the Oscar Mayer Wiener bus and doesn't want anyone to know. She's mad because she's actually Cap'n Crunch. You, th- mm-hmm. you think mm-hmm. you think if I was driving that, that Jamie Loftus wouldn't know? Let's be That's honest. why you got to keep it a secret. Jamie can't be trusted with that knowledge. Yeah. Who well, knows what she'd do? Uh, she'd probably lose her goddamn <laughs> mind. She'd probably write a book and then go on a comedy tour about it. And That's right. That's disclose right. Disclose how fucking horny <laughs> that b- b- automobile is. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Anytime you see that thing going into a tunnel, it's a good time. Just good, yeah. clean fun. Just good, uh. clean fun. So we're back and we're talking about our boy, Bill Bailey. So after 1921, Marie Curie has done her big her big show. Bailey has had a couple of cons get busted by the government, but he is he is off to the races now making radioactive gizmos to to make sure people have all of the radium they need in their diets for optimum health. Uh, He started selling. Yeah, what a hero. Uh, He starts selling a radioactive paperweight called the bio ray, which ensured any working man could keep a healthy dose of uranium poisoning at his desk while he worked. Hell yeah, efficiency, my dog. That's what you need. He sold a radioactive water solution, the Thorinator, which is <laughs> made with putting, thor- it's basically putting thorium in your water. And then there was the Adeno Ray, his next foray into the dick medicine game. The Adeno Ray was a radioactive belt clip that was meant to beam straight radiation into your penis. So really, <laughs> just, a, just a, a great set of products there, right? He invented the early cell phone, you know? <laughs> um, it sounds like he was a plant mm-hmm. by like feminists to be like, yeah. yo, the only way we can get free, mm-hmm. if we're being honest, is we got to murder some of these men. Yeah. Just like a little bit at a time in unseen ways. <laughs> like, oh, you know how they get to go outside the house and work? Mm-hmm. I propose you put one in a paperweight. Enjoy yeah. your work, bitch. You know what else they love? Belts. <laughs> Let's yeah. throw some in there, you know? It's so fucking... Like, I keep thinking about, you know, there's like some of these weirdo right wing guys will like flip out every now. Sperm counts are lower than ever in the West. And, you know, uh, like, man, we made it through the era where people were just putting shooting straight thorium into their penises. Like, it's fine. We'll make it through microplastics as a species. I'm not worried. (laughs) You know, not that there's not health consequences, but people aren't going to stop breeding just because we've poisoned ourselves. We do that a lot. No, fucking intensifies the yeah. more we we yeah. actually yeah. feel like life is being slowly poisoned or yeah. quickly. Everything's fine, folks. So Bailey's products were not cheap, uh, and you might view him as the same kind of dude as like again, like the supplement salesmen who sponsor like Infowars and shit with their Alpha Brain supplements. And this shit is not cheap. His dick cancerizer cost like a thousand dollars. So the primary wait, wait victims, in old timey money. Yeah, in old timey money. So like. This is like buying a nice car, right? Is buying one of these dick cancer machines. Holy fuck. Sorry. I need to like actually process how much money he wants for that dick shit. Yeah. I mean, it comes down in price. Eventually he's selling them for just like 150 bucks as they, but at first, you know, it's harder to get. I would wait for Black Friday, guys. If anybody's looking to buy one of these. Wait for the deal to to irradiate your penis. Wait for the BOGO deal. Yeah. (laughs) Once people start dying, you'll be able to irradiate your tick a lot. Lot cheaper, folks, you know? <laughs> so by this point, his first company, Associated Radium Chemists, had been busted by the Department of Agriculture for false advertising. So this man has now been busted by different government agencies three times. I think three different agencies. I think it's the FDA, the FTC, and now the DOA have all like gone after him for various scams. 
That's nothing the stops EGOT him. of criminals, right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he has done the he has done the fucking patent medication con man EGOT, version yeah. of an EGOT. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so he starts, uh, you know, he forms another company. He starts making new pills. He makes Linarium, which sounds like it was basically radioactive icy hot, and Thorone, which is just a dick pill made out of um, thorium. Right? It's just a thorium dick pill. What's um, wrong with me that when he said so icy many. hot was some radium or, or whatever i yeah. was like that sounds kind of good sounds kind of <laughs> dope i bet it felt good right i bet it felt good that's all i'll say he had founded two new companies by this point the thorone company named after his dick pills was mostly thorium based supplements which he promised were good for all glandular metabolism and faulty chemistry conditions he also so sold the radio indocrinator a gold-plated radium harness that you could use in several ways one around the neck it would rejuvenate your thyroid and around the midsection it would irradiate your adrenals or ovaries uh the radio indocrinator he claimed gave off gamma rays that would ionize the endocrine glands and i'm going to quote from the book quackery again here the idea was that ionizing i.e irradiating the endocrine system would increase hormone production or it was better understood by its less enlightened audience the device worked by lighting up dark recesses of the body the radio endocrinator could even be worn under the scrotum in a special jock strap rigged up to energize uninspired penises <laughs> so that's the good scrotum again. there we're at like three <laughs> different ways you could expose your dick and balls to radiation now like this guy cannot <laughs> irradiate enough testicles like he just loves it he loves it and you know what they say do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life you know eradicate you what it. you love you'll yeah, never yeah. live a day irradiate in your life. what you love and yeah you'll never work a day <laughs> it is again unclear how much he believed in the therapies he was selling this is a guy who takes radiation tonics himself he clearly believes that this is helpful to some extent as do a lot of people but also a lot of his shit is like clearly bogus there's definitely a degree because he's he's done cons before there's certainly a degree to which he knows he's conning people right so you know his stuff goes well though he he starts doing better and better make it getting better at like conning people he really one of the things that's going to set him apart from a lot of the pack is he goes directly to the medical community with a lot of his inventions and part of this is that he's a harvard man he's he knows how to talk to people who went to like these fancy colleges right he knows the right things to say he knows how to put on that proper attitude uh and in 1924 william bailey stands up before an annual meeting of the american chemical society and gives a career defining speech about the medicinal potential of toxic radium exposure he announces we have cornered aberration disease old age and in fact life and death themselves in the endocrines basically like we've backed illness into a corner and is it's in I'm the like endocrine just, system yeah i'm just watching him stand in front of like illnesses and the mm. mission accomplished banner just drops yeah. there yeah. he's like we did it yeah <laughs> <laughs> now when you envision this moment, the speech he gives to the American Chemical Society, you got to think about it the same way we used to think about like Apple's annual product announcement events, right? Will Bailey is the Steve Jobs of radium, right? He's getting up there being like, this is insanely great. You know, you've never been able to irradiate your dick as much as you can now. And a lot of people, many of them doctors, are as excited for this moment as people were in 2008 to see the iPhone. So they listened with rapt attention as he walked them through his newly evolved understanding of how radium therapy was supposed to work by this point bailey had convinced himself or at least decided to market his products under the understanding that aging was caused by the gradual failure of one's endocrine glands this process could be reversed by ionizing them with radiation which would reverse damage and rejuvenate the worn out glands full of pride he told this audience of scientists i am satisfied from definite clinical experience with the radio endocrinator that a method of ionization is now available whereby we can definitely practically without exception retard the progress of sin sense and give a new lease of relatively normal functioning power to those whose son of life is slowly sinking into the purple shadows of that longest night the wrinkled face the drawn skin the dull eye the listless gait the faulty memory the aching body the destructive effects of sterility all spell imperfect endocrine performance so that's cool yeah yeah i mean the voice is really the part that i only part i care about 
Yeah, yeah. I I do I do always enjoy when I get a chance to take that bad boy out for a spin. So <laughs> that is some grade A scientific mumbo jumble, right? Just unparalleled nonsense. But it's sold to his audience. Part Sorry, of this is I haven't because... heard you mention toxins. I'd mm-hmm. like to know yeah. how many toxins um are <sighs> actually gonna be um leaving my body. Yeah. So yeah. what's the what's the toxin situation? You know, Star Trek, the radium is like a teleporter. It beams the toxins right out of your body. You know, the more radium you're exposed to. Yeah, <laughs> there we You could sell this shit today. Right. We're not 100%. far from it. Yeah. Another Republican administration and they'll make it legal to sell this shit again. Right. It'll go everywhere. Joe Rogan will be laughing, at, which honestly could solve a lot of problems for us. Like <laughs> if we just all turned a blind eye to radium medicine for like five or six years. We might be in the I clear. Mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think we just solved a lot of stuff. Just, just now. let him I don't think people yeah. are ready. Yeah. Put like 50 50 ivermectin uranium mix and just let people shoot it up their assholes. You know, it'll be <laughs> fine. So uh, this this shit, this nonsense Bailey's putting out, it sells to his audience. And part of why, again, these are all real scientists, part of why they believe And what he's saying is they think that William Bailey is a scientist like them, right? By this point, he was not just pretending to have graduated from Harvard, but he started he'd started claiming that he'd went on to do graduate work at a prestigious college in London and become a Ph.D., right? He's claiming to be a doctor now. Now, again, in reality, his Harvard admission exam, he got kind of mid grades on and all of his worst grades were in like scientific fields, engineering and physics. He's not he's he, not only is he not a doctor, but this is specifically the shit he's bad at. Right. It's like me selling accounting software. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I'll do your taxes. It. Yeah. I'm like, mm-hmm. if you want to know what to do mm-hmm. with your money. Maybe talk to me who when mm-hmm. someone says stocks, yeah. I just picture a uh, folder and you open it and it's empty. <laughs> yeah, I'm imagining me at like a Jordan Belfort at the end of like when he's doing those big seminars at the end of Wolf of Wall Street. I'm just up in front of a crowd. Folks, you're hearing a lot of things about what you can do with your money. Put it into a 401k, a high yield <laughs> investment fund. No, 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 no. I want to walk you through the real way to get rich. Bury it in a big <laughs> hole. That's right. The big hole method for just $20,000. I will walk you through everything you need to do to dig a big hole in your yard and bury all your money in it. You know, this is what Warren Buffett does. This is what Bill Gates is doing. That's why Bill Gates bought all that farmland. He needs more holes. You know what else? For a very small monthly fee, I will let you keep your money in my big hole. That's right. That's right. You put all your money in my hole, and uh, I promise it'll still be there when you need it. That's right. And it won't yeah. smell weird or anything. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> um, so his lies are not seriously. Again, there are doctors and scientists, as we'll talk about, who are angry at Bailey and all of the, who who do push back about this. But in the mainstream, this is pretty accepted. And in fact, the paper of record, the New York Times, reaches out to Bailey the day after the speech, and they wind up just exerting exerting his excerpting his speech to write an article about the wonders of like irradiating yourself for health. They just without questioning it like reprint chunks of his speech as an article in the New York Times. Um, So he's doing great by 1925. Bailey moves his headquarters to East Orange, New Jersey, and he launches yet another company, the Bailey Radium Laboratories. It was through this company that he would produce his masterpiece, Radithor. This was a pre-bottled radiation-infused beverage. Basically, it's vitamin water if you put a couple Hiroshima's worth of rads inside it. (laughs) So he had the ear of a decent chunk of the scientific community and a lot of credulous journalists. And as a result, Bailey decides his, he's going to do something new to advertise Radithor rather than like these standard patent med ads. I mean, I think he's doing these too, but he starts he starts advertising specifically in like medical journals and publications, right? And this part is actually pretty brilliant. He's kind of on the cutting edge here. He's aware at this point the FTC and the FDA are looking at him and guys like him, right? Putting out specific health claims in like a scientific journal would get him in trouble. He can't do that, but he wants scientific legitimacy. And so he realizes if I just publish research or at least articles that look like research talking in general about radium therapy and how radium affects the human body, but without making claims about my products, if I'm just publishing research on radium and it's attached to the name of my company, that acts as an advertisement. But 
I'm not in danger with the FTC, right? They can't come after smart. me for that. Yeah, he's smart. This is this is a this is a, a an innovation, right? Profesh. Yeah. So instead of saying the Thorinator will cure your depression, <laughs> he just bought in his way into publishing scientific monographs and magazines, and particularly publications read by physicians. And I'm going to quote from the Journal of the American Medical Association here. One example of these monographs, a 32-page pamphlet published in 1926 under the title Modern Treatment of the Endocrine Glands with Radium Water, Radithor, the New Weapon of Medical Science, was mailed to every physician in America. The pamphlet outlines Bailey's theories and urges skeptical physicians to place one or two of your most obstinate cases on radium water so that you may observe its action right in your own practice. The pamphlet also included many photographs that purport to show the process of radium refinement and purification at the Bailey Laboratory. These were later found to be fakes. Bailey simply bought his radium and mesothorium from the nearby American Radium Laboratory of New Jersey, bottling it in distilled water, distilled water at his plant and marking up the price more than 400%. But at least it's real radiation, you know? Yeah, I mean, at least he has integrity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I respect, is a man who sells yeah. honest poison to you, right? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Good man. So Bailey shipped his pamphlets to every registered physician in the country and filled them with testimonials from happy patients and doctors. He helped blaze a trail that would later be followed by Purdue Pharmaceutical decades later in the marketing of OxyContin by offering a rebate to physicians as a professional fee. So if you prescribe Radithor to a patient, whatever they spend on it, you get 17% of that as a kickback directly to you, right? That's yeah. smart. Now, to their credit, the AMA does eventually come after him. It takes him a while, but the AMA is like, this is um, um, unbelievably unethical, like incredibly evil, but it works really well. And again, some of these doctors are prescribing it, uh, are prescribing the equivalent of like uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of doses per patient. So there is good money in this shit, especially because a lot of these patients are rich, right? Like you are milking the rich by poisoning them with radiation, which like... Not necessarily always bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, we've Look, seen worse. It's thing. complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like that. Yeah. In the maybe pile. In the maybe pile, yeah. So from what we can tell, Bailey definitely overhyped his products beyond what he actually believed they could do. But he also That's seems to have been, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. Get all the radiation, radiation, and then you get cocky. Yeah, yeah, and then you start to get a little arrogant, right? Now he seems to have been genuinely convinced that, to some extent, radiation was good medicine. Um, again, he is he becomes a daily user of Radithor. I have found no evidence that he was lying about this. He does seem to have taken his own poison, and we'll talk more about that at the end. Again, I respect him. Is this actually a fan episode? Because yeah, yeah, this is now we're fans of this guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm hearing because we love yeah. him. <laughs> and he does seem to he seems to be upset. And again, he is to some extent consciously still conning people because he has he has made con products like he has made outright cons so he's it, he's both we all contain multitudes right and he he does seem to have an actual obsession with trying to figure out why radium is good for you right he is trying and again he doesn't have any competence as a scientist but he he does try to do his own research here and i'm going to quote from smithsonian magazine again by 1925, Bailey had formulated his central pharmacological thesis concerning radium stimulatory powers. As described in a lecture that he gave in 1925, this thesis was essentially a variant of the radiation as catalyst school of thought. More than 90% of all diseases, claimed Bailey, were the result of endocrinologic func dysfunction that prevented the transmission of essential physiological factors. Without the correct metabolic signals, the body lapsed into a state of biochemical energy deprivation. Eventually, this state exhausted the perigonymal organs, resulting in anemia, lassitude, cancer, depression, idiocy, and many other problems. Bailey believed that the energy lost through ineffective metabolism could be replenished using the power of radium's alpha particles, thus allowing the body to return to its proper state of oxidative uh, metabolic balance through radioactive gland control. Yeah, that all scans. That seems real. Sure. Yeah, actually, uh, me and my girls, yeah, our band, uh, radi Radioactive Gland Control, so... Um, yeah, yeah, that's actually playing. a pretty good band we're actually, name. Yeah. yeah, we're fucking yeah. actually opening for um, uh -huh. what's the name of that um, of of the name of that like device that that dude was peddling to make your dick. What was it called? Yeah. Um. Oh. Uh. Uh. Thorone. Yeah. Yeah, we're actually opening Thorone. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and speaking of irradiating your dick again, you can buy some dick pills that probably aren't radioactive if you listen to these ads. Ah, we're back, and uh, yeah, we're we're talking Bill Bailey. So Radathor takes the fuck off. This is a huge success. He finally has his big hit, right? It's fucking it's it's fucking wild. He sells more than four hundred thousand half ounce bottles of Radathor in just five years. Um, and again, these are all four hundred percent markup. So he is making bank off this shit. Um, now, by this point, the boom years of Radathor, evidence had begun to mount that there were horrific long term health consequences to being exposed to radiation. And this is going to bring us to a bit of a digression, but this is a story worth telling the <laughs> infamous tale of the radium girls. It is. This is a fuck. I think a lot of people are broadly aware of this, which is why I didn't like make it the whole focus. But this is a wild ass story. Uh, it is laid out in gripping detail by author Kate Moore in her book, The Radium Girls. Um, yeah, but I, I was like, yeah. why do I know the, yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I think people have heard this and this is a the radium girl story is a standard story of like an evil corporation abusing its workers for profit, you know, when they should have known better and ultimately killing them. It's very shady. I wanted to focus more on the patent medication stuff because that's more fun. But we are going to talk about the radium girls now. This is this is where shit gets pretty bleak. As I've noted before, sufficient doses of radium and like toothpaste will make your teeth glow, right? This was a thing people advertised for at the time. This meant that radium, because it can glow, has the potential practical uses. You can make stuff like watches and dials that need to glow in the dark glow, right? For like planes, for military equipment, right? For industrial equipment and like it's obviously it's useful if you have like a watch that can glow in the dark, right? Um, you don't yeah, have to like, like a, turn like a, a line road on. divider or whatever. Yeah, a road divider, a compass, right? You know, all of the different things you need if you're like firing artillery in the night or some shit. So obviously there's a military application. A lot of this takes off like radium dial painting takes off as an industry when we get into World War One because there's a sudden demand for the equipment that they need to be able to have like dials lit up on. And this is a demanding job, right? You cannot if you are pu- if you are working on stuff that's going to be military, it's going to be used to like drop bombs and fire shells at people. It has to be precise, right? You have to be accurately putting everything on. So that is, you know, a job that is has to be done by skilled workers. And there's no other way to apply this stuff than by hand, right? It has to be done by hand. And women who, with tiny hands were generally seen to be the best at this job, right? So dial painting becomes... Oh my becomes... God, Robert, just fucking text me next time. <laughs> I want to the pod to just fucking compliment me like this. Mm-hmm. You would have been a great radium girl, like, although it's girl. You have those radium girl hands. <laughs> you, got the, you got those radium girl hands. You don't want to have those because it does not end well for them. But I this know. is considered an incredible job for a while, right? It has a reputation for being the elite job of poor working girls because it pays three times normal factory wages. Kate Moore notes that dial painters were in the top 5% of female workers nationally when it came to compensation. So like this is seen for ambitious, poor young women. This is how you get a leg up. This is how you can escape poverty, right? Which is, again, why this is a lot less fun than selling radioactive poison to rich people. Because these jobs are so good, the first women who get them guard them jealously, often recruiting close friends and they keep it in the family, right? They're like, if there's an opening, I'm going to make sure my sister, my aunt, yeah. my niece gets the job rather than like somebody off the street. And so... One of the things that's going to be devastating about this is that often factories will have like multiple sisters, all the sisters in a family working side by side on the production line. And, you know, one guess as to how their lives end. Right. Other workers at the factory. And this is very important. The radium girls are not wearing any kind of PPE. They are they are they are exposed directly physically through their skin with a mix of radium and paint, right? It's like mixed into a powder and then turned into a paint, basically. They have no protective gear. The workers at the factory that is making the paint, that's mixing these pigments that are processing raw radium, they wear protective gear, right? They've got like lead aprons. They're wearing gloves. Like yeah, they they're understand. Men, though, and so they, they, they matter. In fa- they, in fact, are men. <laughs> yeah, they matter. Like that's yeah. obvious. Like what are we going to be wasting safety yeah. equipment on yeah. fucking vaginas? That is a asses? big part. That is a big part of what's going on. But that's, it's interesting. That's not all of it. As we'll talk about, a lot of these men are insanely reckless with this stuff 
in, in ways that kind of confuse me because they do know it's dangerous. They're covering up the dangers for the women, but they are also taking risks with this shit. I, I don't fully get some of it. You get the feeling, I think, radium and uranium and shit when people first started fucking with it i think it kind of there's a high i don't know if it's like an actual physical high that it affects your brain but like because of all of the buzz around this because of how new and exciting is it deranges people a little bit i i don't i don't know that i don't think there's like a medical or pharmacological i think it's a psychological thing but it it does appear to be we'll talk about this in a bit but that does well appear i love to be that happening. you mentioned that you mentioned in the last uh in the first yeah half. yeah but i was thinking like since the life expectancy is so mm. not great, yeah, like how many studies could there have been possibly done? Oh, there's none at this point, right? Right? No. Like for for somebody like you might absolutely be 100 percent correct. Like, how would you check that? Yeah, I mean, they, they know that it can kill you just because like pure radium will like burn people. People have died as a result of that. But the idea that like tiny amounts, like for one thing, it hasn't been being used long enough that people who are being exposed constantly to smaller doses are getting aren't getting cancer yet. So you can't really like it's just not as it wasn't immediately clear, although, as we'll talk about, they did know enough that they should have been taking precautions. Right. Yeah. But they certainly don't know nearly as much as we know now. Right. And part of why they're not giving these girls PPE is that the paint used by the radium girls is so diluted. They're like, it can't, this is not enough to be dangerous. And again, part of how they're thinking about this, they're not thinking about this the way we think about radiation, which is like, yeah, you want to, <laughs> you want to be exposed to as little radiation as possible, right? They're thinking about it as well in high doses, super concentrated, you know, radium can be very dangerous to people, but in lower doses, it's a medicine. It treats these different illnesses. So it's like, they're thinking about it the way we think of aspirin, right? Obviously, if you were to like, Chow, chow down on a brick of aspirin, you would get very sick. But if you take a pill when you've got a headache or whatever, you feel better. You know, that's kind of how they're thinking about this. Right. So they're like, well, in these doses, it's not going to hurt these girls. Right. Um, now, obviously, this is absurd, uh, as Kate Moore writes in a column for BuzzFeed. Radium's luminosity was part of its allure, and the dial painters soon became known as the Ghost Girls, because by the time they finished their shifts, they themselves would glow in the dark. They made the most of the perk, wearing their good dresses to the plant so they'd shine in the dance halls at night, and even painting radium onto their teeth for a smile that would knock the suitors dead. Grace and her colleagues obediently followed the technique they'd been taught for the painstaking handiwork of painting the tiny dials, some of which were only three and a half centimeters wide. The girls were instructed to slip their paintbrushes between their lips to make a a fine point, a practice called lip pointing or lip dip paint routine, as playwright Melanie Marnick later described it. Every time the girls raised the brushes to their mouths, they swallowed a little bit of the glowing green paint. So that's that's great. That's Super good. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the women who instructed Grace in this technique later recalled to an interviewer, the first thing we asked was, does this stuff hurt you? <laughs> Naturally, you don't want to put anything in your mouth that is going to hurt you. Mr. Savoy, the manager, said it wasn't dangerous, that we didn't need to be afraid. Now, this was a lie. Even given the incomplete understanding of radiation at the time, they knew enough to know that there was a danger to the job. These women, again, the men handling radium in labs are wearing lead aprons and, you know, tongs and shit. These women are not even warned that those precautions exist, right? They're not being told that, like, there is an amount of radium that's dangerous because that is that's common knowledge to scientists. But to lay people, there's no knowledge that there's any danger to this stuff. It's like widespread. And like, so even though... I think a lot of these guys legitimately believed they were not being exposed to enough to hurt them. These women were not being told that there are e any potential dangers to radium, which like is irresponsible. The found is particularly bad because the founder of the U S radium corporation, which employed the radium girls was a scientist named Sabine von Sochaki. He literally invented the paint that they used. And he was aware of the dangers of radium, even in smaller quantities. Again, this is not just some businessman who like adopts this because it's good money. This is a scientist. He had worked personally with the Curies in the earliest radium research. He had seen radiation burns and he had been injured by radiation himself. And I'm going to quote from the radium girl here. From them and from the specialist medical literature he had studied, Von Sochaki understood that radium carried great dangers. The Curies by that time were intimately familiar with radium's hazards, having suffered many burns themselves. Radium could cure tumors, it was true, by destroying unhealthy tissue, but it was indiscriminating in its powers and could devastate healthy tissue too. Von Sochaki himself had suffered its silent and sinister wrath. 
Radium had gotten into his left index finger, and when he realized, he hacked the tip of it off. It now looked as though an animal had gnawed it. Of course, to the layman, this was all unknown. The mainstream position, as understood by most people, was that the effects of radium were all positive, and that was what was written about in newspapers and magazines. So, again... This guy... That finger is, shit is intense, yeah, dude. Yeah, like he cut his own finger off when he got a little bit of it in there. He knows these girls are taking a risk and he just doesn't care, right? Like I made the the sexism joke earlier, which yeah. you know, I'm sure is a part of it, but I I mostly think, honestly, it's a classism thing, right? It's yeah. Like a, it's yes. like you don't ki- give a fuck. Uh, like, you know, okay, I'm going to recommend this book that I've talked about before called Fashion Victims by Allison Matthews David. I sent you guys it because I'm going to do a podcast with her. But she talks about all of the different like ways that clothes were essentially killing people that were making them and wearing them. But one of the things is like the people that work in the factories matter so little that their lives are totally an okay thing to sacrifice, which is like why workers' rights even had to be a thing, you know? People were just like, oh yeah, we give a fuck about the people that make our shit. Like that would not even be an issue, clearly. Anyway, I'm not saying anything new, but yeah. No, no, yeah. That's I, I always valid to like bring up, especially when we, as we're in this new age of unionization, like there's a good reason why. Because without unions and worker protections they would literally just poison us all with radium for yeah to buck, death and they right? don't care because there's a million more people why, who why would you a give a shit yeah yeah and again i will say as we're as we're critiquing him for this very validly he is also again the, he has this kind of irrational transfiction with radium right and by all reports he was also pretty reckless with this shit he was known to play with it to hold tubes of radium with his bare hands to watch like he would turn the light off so he could like watch its luminosity in the dark he would expose his arm up to the elbow in radium solutions company co-founder george willis was also really reckless he would pick up tubes of radium with his like four finger finger and they were supposed to use forceps but he would just use his hands um and again these guys are so reckless with this stuff because they just kind of love it and their colleagues are like well these guys are the scientists if they're doing this it must be safe and again like if you saw this in a movie and you do see it and like you know a superhero movie when a like a villain or whatever is like drawn to a thing you're always like this is so ridiculous but listening the way that these people actually relate to uranium and shit that is exactly i'm like there's wild right a psychological yeah something component that is connected to it because like yeah that's not normal no and it, yeah th- i do i don't fully understand what it is but something is clearly going on here because these people are tr- yeah they're treating it yeah like like a fucking s- villain in a spider-man movie treats like the That's superhero serum or some shit right like they're willing to foe right here yeah yes and it's interesting because like a lot, there are scientists, prominent ones who are warning about this. One of them, normally, this is the only time we're going to bring up Thomas Edison and him not be the bastard. But Thomas Edison was aware of all this and thought it was fucking crazy. He, he remarked right around this time, there may be a condition into which radium has not yet entered that would produce dire results. Everybody handling it should have care, right? That's po- again, the only time Edison says something perfectly reasonable. But like, yeah, man, they probably should be wearing protection he's basically like we don't understand this stuff and you're just you're sticking your arm into a vat of it what is wrong with you like this burns people we should be careful here now you will not be surprised to hear that the effect of all of this radium on the bodies of the young women painting these dials was nothing short of calamitous the radium that they had eaten particularly settled inside their bodies and basically honeycombs their bones with radiation it is drilling holes inside their bones like swiss cheese this kills their marrow and it causes their bodies to literally collapse in on it themselves like a dying star one worker uh this this young woman named grace her spine is crushed she has is like given a brace basically her spine just crumbles inside of her another girl has her jaw eaten away to a stump some girls would shrink they would like lose multiple inches because their leg bones are just crumbling and compacting from the inside and while all of this is going on their bones were glowing in the dark right So fucked up. Like it is some of these women first realized they were sick when they saw their they would see their own bones glowing back at them in the mirror. Like what the fuck? Yeah, it's insane. And like, yeah, we've got a picture here. This is um one of the radium girls who has 
I mean, honestly, I, I don't mean to be like blithe about this. It looks like a 90s prosthetic. Like if you were going to give someone a fake chin for like a skit where they're, you know, you're trying to make them look like Jay Leno or something like that's what. But it's just a tumor. It's like a tumor that's a good eight inches of like chin, basically, like it's probably even more. And it's also gruesome. Very girthy. It's yeah, that's, it's really thick. So I mean, it is. It's actually it's more like the mass of a brick that's just stuck under her jaw. Yeah. Like the tumors these these young women got are ghastly. Some of the most unsettling body horror shit I have ever encountered in in my research. Like it is gnarly. And yeah, obviously, by the time you have this kind of radium exposure, there's no cure or treatment. You can't fix this. Like this is this is by the time your bones are glowing in the dark, you're dead. You know. But also, like, how much research and work would have to even be done for anybody to even try to reverse it yeah i mean like there's no way to even like there's so far behind the ball on that but even then i think today by this point i don't think there's shit we could do for these girls oh no we can't we can't fix it i'm just saying like the amount of time you would need to figure out how to solve something like this like they do not have that time (laughs) yeah no absolutely not like this is a death sentence and they you know these are not dumb people these women like they realize as soon as they they don't know what radiation poisoning is because it's not really well known at that point but they know by the time your bones are crumbling inside of you well i'm going to die right they they are not they are not possessed yeah. of like irrational like ex- like hope here you know they're very aware like oh my god my job has fucking killed me i was lied to right mm-hmm Now, while they start coming out, going to the press, trying to, like, get help, like, get, you know, basically the equivalent of workman's comp for getting poisoned at work, the radium industry, these companies making the paints, painting the dials, deny there is any danger to their products. They basically say these girls are crazy. Something else is wrong with them. Radium, we all know radium is a health product, right? And there's so little of it in this paint that no one could get harmed by it, right? And in fact, when the story that radium girls are getting sick breaks in the news, the New York Times is like, like, well, we got to report on this. See if, you know, see what's up to it. You know who can tell us if these girls are full of shit or not? Our buddy, William Bailey. So they call <laughs> Will Bailey, the guy selling radium water. And he's like, there's no proof that radium is responsible for any of these deaths. You know, nobody gets sick from radium. This is just nonsense. They're women, you know, they don't know anything. It's like, just that's, also awesome that mm-hmm. if you want to know about a thing, you don't go to the people that have the thing. No. You're like, no, what the well, fuck women, would we stand you know? to learn from them? No, Will Bailey's a scientist. We, the New York Times, didn't check to verify that he has any kind of degree, but he says he's a scientist. Who would lie about that? Not a man selling radium. No one would lie about being a Harvard man. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, I bet that is a big part of it. I bet the fucking reporter who reached out as some Harvard-educated writer and was like, well, a Harvard man would never poison people for money. (laughs) He would never lie on behalf of his industry. So... Now, I will say, again, a lot of the doctors and stuff we're talking about this are are not good people. There are some these girls, you know, when they get sick, this is horrifying. And the physicians who are seeing them and realizing what's happened are horrifying. And some very brave, crusading physicians basically go to bat against a significant chunk of the medical industry and against the radium industry to, like, try to get not just get justice for these girls, because to an extent that's impossible, but to try and stop people from being exposed to radium, right? Because they, they they realize, oh, if these girls are getting sick from radium paint. All of these products on the shelves are full of radium. Potentially, got, th- tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people could be getting sick. We have to stop this shit, right? And the radium girls, though, I will say, you know, these doctors, a lot of these doctors, they testify, they, they, they are great. The, the primary response to this, to the, this attempt to kind of bring it into this industry is centered around these radium girls who are actively dying and basically organize a very effective crusade to bring their employer to some sort of justice and to put a stop to this shit. And these, again, this is an incredibly heroic story. These girls are aware we cannot be saved, right? We are doing this to stop other sure? people from getting sick and dying. Grace Fryer, who is one of the one of the radium girls, uh, said at the time, it is not for myself I care. I am thinking more of the hundreds of girls to whom this may serve as an example. Kate Moore writes, quote, 
It was Grace who led their fight, determined to find a lawyer even after countless attorneys turned her down, either disbelieving the women's claims, running scared from powerful radium corporations, or being unprepared to fight a legal battle that demanded the overturn of existing legislation. At the time, radium poisoning was not a compensable disease. It hadn't even been discovered until the girls got sick. And the women were also stymied by the statute of limitations, which ruled that victims of occupational poisoning had to bring their legal cases within two years. Radium poisoning was insidious, so most girls did not start to sicken until at least five years after they started work. They were trapped in a vicious legal circle that seemingly could not be squared. But Grace was the daughter of a union delegate, and she was determined to hold a clearly guilty firm to account. Eventually, in 1927, a smart young lawyer named Raymond Barry accepted their case, and Grace, along with four colleagues, found herself at the center of an internationally famous courtroom drama. By now, however, time was running out. The women had been given just four months to live, and the company seemed intent on dragging out the legal proceedings. As a consequence, Grace and her friends were forced to settle out of court. But they had raised the profile of radium poisoning, just as Grace had planned. And, you know... It, this is, again, you know, they're not able to take the, the, the radium girls, this first group of them, Grace, they're not able to take this case as far as they want to because they don't have much time. But mm -hmm. they settle, they get money for their families, and this becomes an international story. And so thousands, hundreds, uh, you know, at least hundreds of other women, and I, I also assume an equal number of men at least, working in various industries with radium, find out for the first time that this shit is dangerous, right? And it is... Like this is like a horror movie scene, right? As these as these stories start to come out and they're being read in offices where people are using radium paint and doing other shit with mm -hmm. radium, right? One and dial came in after brushing yeah. their teeth with yeah, radium, with, with their radium know? toothpaste. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's just looking at their glass of radium water, being like, oh yeah. no. One young woman who worked for another radium corporation, she's a dial painter as well, but in a different state, she's in Illinois. Uh Catherine Wolf later recalled there were meetings at our plant that bordered on riots. The chill of fear was so depressing that we could scarcely work. And now I bet you're wondering, why the fuck would you keep working after you learn this? Well, you got to keep in mind, a lot of this shit is breaking right at the start of the Great Depression, right? And in the middle of the Great Depression. And so people are suddenly aware, oh my God, this is killing me. But also, you know what'll kill my family is if I can't buy food for my kids that I'm a single mother to suddenly. If we get shit pushed out on the street when there are no other jobs so they really this is like it's an impossible situation right you don't want to die of cancer but also starvation's right around the corner starvation's right there too yeah it's um it's fucked it's fucked up so yeah uh real bummer but you know what's not a bummer Sophia, these goods and services <laughs> these goods good and stuff? services that's not a bummer at all just a good time so have some products folks right oh Now, we're back. So this is, it's also, you know, part of why people don't quit immediately, why there's like a lot of confusion in the industry among these workers is just like, well, we still need money. And another part of it is that the companies, all these radium companies, they're kind of, I, I, I haven't read precisely if the tobacco industry looks at how these companies respond when they formulate their own responses later in the century to a similar sort of like, you know, uh, um, revelation but they use a lot of the same tactics that will later be used by big tobacco and the biggest one is they flood the zone with disinformation the illinois firm that wolf worked at radium dial denied any responsibility and the way that they do this is they come in and they say you know we're concerned obviously about our workers we don't want anyone to get hurt so we did medical tests you know we studied we, we did tests on these women who got sick to try and see if they had radium poisoning now here's the thing they had done medical tests on these employees. And those tests had shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that all of these women had radiation poisoning. So what does radium dial do? They just lie. They just say the test didn't show anything and they burn that fucking research. <laughs> to further muddle waters, they paid for a full page ad where they stated, if we at any time had reason to believe that any conditions of the work endangered the health of our employees, we would have at once suspended operations. Now, Listen, if we had known Harvey Weinstein was some sort of a raper, we would have never allowed him to dominate the film industry like he has. Oh, God. So here's the thing. This actually gets more ghoulish than that. This is one of the worst things I've ever heard about a company doing. Because 
Not only are they hiding research that proves that their employees are getting sick from this work, not only are they lying to people where they continue to get exposed to more radium, not only are they putting out propaganda, but when their workers die, obviously families who are losing their kids could pay for an independent autopsy, could have research done, could have these bones studied, and that would oh, prove no. that these girls, they steal the bones of these dead girls. To hide, to like destroy them so that it Man, can't be like they are stealing the steal bones, their bones of their employee of their dead employee. That is. Oh, and you gone ahead and you said steal their uh, bones. Steal their bones. I think that might be the worst thing I've heard of a company doing to their workers. Oh, that's like not all their bones. It's, it's a high bar, but that's. That's like, I mean, when I say ghoulish, I'm not like, that's not even figured. That is literal ghoul shit. You are stealing the bones of a corpse. That is mm. actual, just literal ghoul shit. No, nah, they're motherfucking bones, my dog. Yeah, oh. that is <laughs> pretty bad. So, 1938. It's like you know. when fucking, um, is it Mormons that like convert? Oh, dead people, you yeah. Well, they're like, they'll gone. make Anne Frank into a Mormon. Yeah, yeah, they'll like come through a Jewish cemetery and be like, mm -hmm. you're a Mormon now. Man, I, I, have, I have applied what I call the Anne Frank rule, which is that if you start to bring up or, or, or reference Anne Frank in anything other than, for example, the diary of Anne Frank, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Let, let, don't do that. Like, let, let her be. <laughs> she, she wrote her book. Talk about the book if you want to. If you are bringing up Anne Frank for any other reason, cease. It's not it's necessary. It's like the Martin Luther King rule. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. are you white? Could yeah. you not bring no, Martin no. Luther King into your arguments? Thank you Leave so it much. be. <laughs> There's plenty of things that he said. Just stop. Just let stop. Let the man rest. He yeah. does not need to be made a part of this. <laughs> yeah. So, um... In 1938, not long after Catherine Wolf, you know, that the stories had gone viral in her workplace. They're having these meetings, you know, freaking out. Do we have to worry about getting cancer? Shortly after that point, Catherine wakes up with a tumor on her hip. And in very short order, it grows Fuck. to the size of a grapefruit. Her teeth start to fall out. The detail that like fucked me up about this is that she winds That's up. That's my nightmare. She's like picking fragments of her jawbone outside of her mouth out of her mouth like because it's just crumbling inside of her this is my fucking nightmare honestly yeah. like, literally i have nightmares about this oh god it's yeah I, it's i can't imagine really much worse other than like this happening to your kid right that's the only thing worse than this happening yeah to you. like and i i don't think i would be a functional person if i were going through this Catherine launches a fucking war on her employer, like while she is literally pulling fragments of her own jaw out of her head on a daily basis. Her body is rotting on her. She fucking organizes a legal campaign against them. She what a sues. Bad bitch. She's fucking these. The all of these ladies are fucking awesome. She sues her employer, uh, which is one of, you know, and this is like, not only is this not easy because they have a lot of money, but her neighbors start coming after her when she sues the radium dial company because it's the Great Depression. There's not a lot of other employers. So they're like, you're threatening everyone's ability to make a living, right? They don't care that they're in danger too. I want my husband to go to the job that's killing yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Catherine does not let this stop her. She testifies before a judge. She like she, the court case goes through again. The company tries to delay it. She gets too sick to go into court. And so she has they have the judge and the lawyers show up to her house. She gives her like testimony on her deathbed. And she and her lawyer, Leonard Grossman, win their case. The horrific story of the Radium Girls builds popular support for a whole raft of new regulations. A lot of our working workers regulations come out of the backlash to what happened to these girls and in fact Catherine and this whole the like the 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 series of court cases launched by the radium girls are a major factor in the establishment of OSHA right this is a big part of how we get OSHA and you know it is obviously does not save any of these young women but they are continuing to save lives to this day uh, before OSHA about 14,000 Americans died on the job every year. And again, this is like when the country's a third the size that it is now. Today, about 4,500 workers die on the job every year, right? Still too many, but like that is like the- Huge the improvement. They, these, these girls saved a lot of lives, you know, while losing their own. Um, it's, a, it's as admirable a story as I've ever heard.
Heroes. So that is a long digression from the story of William Bailey, although he did tie into this. You know, he's giving comments to the New York Times. Uh, but you can't really talk about radium poisoning without talking about the radium girls, nor should you. So one crucial difference here between what the Radium Dial Corporation and these other radium companies that these girls work at is doing and what Bailey is doing um, is that the death toll of the radium dial companies is very well documented because we have all these these women who go to work there and they get sick and we know they died and we know, we know it was because of the radium that they were exposed to at work. We don't know how many people died or were maimed as a result of all of the radiation they got from Will Bailey's products like because Number one, it's a lower dose than the radium dial girls are getting, um, but they're taking it sometimes. Some of these people are taking it for years, and then maybe 10 years later, they get a cancer. And like, well, they were a smoker, too. They, now, of course, we know that if you're a smoker, you're going to get more lung cancer faster if you're also exposed to radium, right? It is not known. We will never know how many people died because of this guy's stuff. But like, he's tens of thousands of people are taking the radium products that he he makes, maybe more. I think his death toll is significant. I think I'm guessing this guy's got at least a 911 on him, you know, but I, I don't think it's provable. Right. It should also be noted that the radium dial corporation and others were at least manufacturing products that did something right. They had a function. Bailey is just selling pure snake oil. You know, whether or not that makes him better or worse is pointless to discuss. But I do think the difference is interesting. It's also worth noting that the progress that came about as a result of the Radium Girls Brave Battle was not immediate. As late as 1930, the FDA had taken no serious action against Bailey or his compatriots. And these this last court case like ends in 1928. Right. So. There is starting to be backlash building and, and people agitating to like really restrict where this stuff can be used. But in 1930, the FDA is still like, we don't have any legal basis to go after this guy. Several warnings. The FDA does publish warnings uh, because of, you know, all of these grisly photos of dying dial painters, but they, they don't really do anything. The FTC is a bit faster on the on the draw. In 1928, which is the year that Catherine Wolfe sues the radium dial company, they start an investigation into William Bailey's company, right? Particularly into the claims he's making about Radathor. But this takes a while to work its way through the system. Um, but in so in 1930, two years later, they finally charge him with false advertising. Now, unclear if that would have been enough to bring him down. He has enough money at this point to have fought this. But this charge comes across at the same time as another very significant development, which is what's going to actually bring it into not just Bailey, but this whole industry. And of course, it's a rich white guy getting sick from radium poisoning. Right. Oh, that's, no, that's the worst. Possible that leads outcome. to real fast changes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Eben M. Byers is an upper class athlete. He's a competitive trap shooter. Um, and he was the champion of the U.S. Amateur Golf Tournament in 1907. Oh, yeah. You, you didn't say he was yeah. that kind of white. That's like yeah, he is. White he is white. golf champion white. He is also the CEO of a metal foundry. Uh, he is a millionaire who is famous for his parties and womanizing. Smithsonian yep. Magazine writes that his, quote, suave demeanor and social conquest at nearby girls schools earned him the nickname Foxy Grandpa. So Ew, that's probably that's probably something criminal, right? That's probably that's probably bad. Ew, Foxy <laughs> yeah. Grandpa. Foxy Grandpa. Yeah, because he's going after women or, or I, people who are so young, dude. right? Mm -hmm. I'm not he's sad. This like guy winds Kelly up dying horribly it around yeah. town. Yeah, I'm like, like it bitch, is. <laughs> you can't even sing. <laughs> it is funny that like you have these deeply sympathetic, really incredible people these these radium girls get sick and die and it slowly brings change but like the worst man in the world gets sick on radium and it's this instant fucking backlash yeah seriously it's like the like the lacrosse yeah. like rapist guy yeah and everyone's well, do, like well now we gotta end radiation you, you do have to think of this guy he's like a gatsby type right oh like of course he, he, i pictured yeah. leonardo yeah. DiCaprio yeah. immediately. yeah 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 he's when, got like horse racing stables in multiple countries yeah you said Foxy Grandpa. I immediately uh, thought Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, immediately. yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so his downfall, Eben Byers' downfall, begins in 1927. He's you know attending the an annual Harvard Yale football game, and on his way back, he's got a private. He owns a private train car. 
He's like partying with his friends and he falls drunkenly off of his top bunk and injures his arm. You know, he thinks it's just like a sprain or something, but the pain doesn't leave him. You know, he, he goes to a bunch of doctors. He takes different treatments for weeks, all these different physical therapies. And, you know, months go by and it's just not it's still this chronic pain. Uh, he can't play golf anymore, and the constant pain makes it hard. He can't get erections anymore. So he's like, anything, I'll do anything to to deal with he's this like, pain. He's like, one, no golf. Two, no more mm-hmm. trap shooting. Yeah, yeah. And three, <laughs> no more pussy. Like, mm-hmm. I will kill myself. Yeah, you have to fix me, Doc. Um, so he's got all this money. He shops around for doctors until he finds one named Charles Moyer. Now, Moyer is one of these doctors who who is aware of Bailey's kickback program on Radathor and is like, if I get this rich guy to take a shitload of Radathor, I'll get I'm getting a fucking I'm getting a point or I'm getting a couple of points off of each bottle he buys, right? Mm-hmm. So Byers tries this stuff. He like says, Hey, try this Radathor shit. It'll cure you. Byers tries it and he likes it, right? He feels energized. He starts feeling like his old self again. He can get hard, he can play golf. Again, I don't know, oh is this the placebo God. effect? Did he just finally did his, or was his arm just actually healing? Um, and he should have given it more time. I don't know. But he claims to feel fucking great. And in fact, he falls, he is, he is like the power user of Radathor, right? He's drinking on a daily basis. He's drinking three times the maximum, maximum recommended dose. And he loves it that as gifts, he starts buying cases of it for his friends and loved ones. Like, But he's also he... like taking it off label, right? So like three times yeah. the maximum amount. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his doctor's like, sure, that's just three times as much money for me. Fuck it. <laughs> he buys cases whenever he gets a new girlfriend. And I think the term girl is very literal there. He'll give them cases of Radathor to drink for their own health. And he starts using it to water his racehorses. Oh, um, no, don't between, fucking kill the horses. Yeah, yeah. Between 1927 and 1931, he personally consumes between 1,000 and 1,500 bottles of the stuff. Estimates that have been done recently, you know, after the fact, when we started to learn how to measure radiation better, scientists now estimate that he exposed himself to about three times a fatal dose of radiation over the course of four years, the equivalent of several thousand x-rays. Wow. So that's cool. (laughs) Starting in early 1931, Byers began to experience increasing complications. His bones seemed to be eating themselves, splintering and dissolving one by one. His marrow failed and his kidneys stopped working. A brain abscess destroyed his hearing. By the end, he was bedridden, unable to move or hear, but still alive and horribly alert. Now, his social prominence means you cannot sweep this under the rug. This is a famous rich guy. Uh, a radiologist, Joseph Steiner, who looked at the radiographs of Byers' rotting bones, launched a crusade of his own. He had to take action because the other doctors who worked with Byers, including Byers' personal physician, refused to acknowledge that this was radium intoxication, right? I think because they're all getting kickbacks. They're like, no, man, you're not sick because of radium. You just need to yeah, <laughs> drink more milk. <laughs> So this guy Steiner is like, no, this is fucking radium poisoning. He's been poisoned by this stupid drink he's taking. And, you know, he makes this enough of a noise about this that a government commission is formed to investigate. And they have buyers. Again, he becomes the, another person. He testifies from his sickbed right before he dies to this commission. An attorney who was present to that testimony later described, quote, A more gruesome experience in a more gorgeous setting would be hard to imagine. We went to Southampton, where Byers had a magnificent home. There we discovered him in a condition with beggar's description. Young in years and mentally alert, he could hardly speak. His head was swathed in bandages. He had undergone two successive jaw operations, and his whole upper jaw, excepting two front teeth, and most of his lower jaw had been removed. All the remaining bone tissue of his body was slowly disintegrating, and holes were actually forming in his skull. Jesus Christ. Yeah, pretty fucked up. Pretty bad. On December 19th, 1931, the commission issued a cease and desist to Bailey's company. This did not help Byers. He dies in early 1932, but his death provides the impetus for the FDA to push for expanded power so that they can take action against quack medication. A lot of the FDA's what teeth it has come out of this period as a result of this. A backlash boiled over from the medical community against patent drugs like Radathor. Regulations came quickly and Bailey's business collapsed. He escaped any personal consequences for this or his role in any other countless number of deaths, though. 
We know of at least one female friend of his who died because he kept giving her Radathor. Uh, but the number of people who developed cancer as a result of taking his and uh, you know his other products is is kind of unknown. Um, Bailey does become persona non grata after this point. He's, you know, the press starts going after him. He's like hounded in the streets by journalists and stuff. There's these constant inquiries from like Newark public health officials. Eventually he has to flee town, right? Um, worker or reporters find him at, uh, his office front, uh, at the Adeno Ray company in East Orange. And when they ask what kind of business he's conducting, he's like, it's an advertising business. And they're like, well, the name on the door is the same as this radiation product you were selling. And he's like, oh, no, the name on the door doesn't mean a thing. I'm not selling anything radioactive. <laughs> Eventually, he has to, like, drop out of public life entirely. Although, weirdly yeah, enough. I feel like he, he's like Army Hammer. Kind of. He has more of a second act than Army Hammer. Oh, no. He somehow gets a job as the editor of a newspaper in New Jersey and, like, pivots to being a politics influencer. He writes books on, like, global politics and, like, yeah. health. In World War II, he's an aircraft observer under the first fighter command. He invents a method of swimming instruction for soldiers. Um, he, like, puts together a... He, a, a, he possibly... It's hard to tell how much of this. He definitely does some of this. Some of it's lies. Like, he claims that he was the manager of an IBM electronics division during the war, and we don't actually know if that's the case or not. There's not evidence of it, really. I feel like charlatans be charlataning. Yeah. So it's hard for me to, like, know if, like, any of the achievements or whatever... Are it's true. It, yeah. What we do know for a fact is that on May 16th, 1949, in Tinsboro, Massachusetts, he dies aged 74 from bladder cancer. And this is almost certainly due to all of the radiation tonics that he drank over the course of his life. So he lasted too long still, but uh, I don't know. Shane McGowan beat him by a year. So there's that. <laughs> You've never read the book a drink with shane mcgowan you should absolutely oh yeah 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 yeah, absolutely yeah this is not to you but to like a person listening Mm -hmm. yeah and and listen to i mean all of his albums are great i'm always if you if you're looking for an inroad into the pogues rum sodomy and the lash never been beat Uh, incredible and but also like read it read the Mm -hmm. book listen to the music at the same time it's fucking tight hell yeah hell yeah well that's a happy note to end on listen listen to and read Shane McGowan. Um, don't irradiate yourself for unclear health benefits. Yeah, just, Sophia. You no, know, if you were gonna <laughs> drink some uranium tonight, maybe don't. Maybe don't. <laughs> maybe no mm-hmm. uranium to drink tonight. You know, like you do, you girl. Okay, you can girl boss yeah. your wings and some yeah. uranium if you want. <laughs> yeah, Who am I to tell you. <laughs> uh so got anything to plug? Yes, please. Follow me to my new Patreon, patreon.com slash Sophia Alexandra. And um, you can read my writing there and you can look at pictures and stuff and watch videos. It's it's a good ass time. So come through. Yeah. Yeah. Come through. Check it out. And, uh, you know, go to hell. I love you. We we all love you. Take care Uh of yourself. Unless you're yeah. Bill Bailey. Okay, Unless bye. Unless you're Bill Bailey. Yeah. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 